Shana Ray. Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another edition of our weekly real estate backstory, where we kind of go over the comings and goings of all the things happening in the real estate world. We try and expose the soft underbelly of what's kind of going on. So my name is Alan Richardson. I'm the managing broker here, Maximum Realty and Realtor Partners. My name is Ming Richardson. I'm the compliance broker for Maximum One Realty and Realtor Partners. And we kind of want to uh, start off today with jumping into some reasons why we see some of our deals are falling through, because Ever since interest rates have really started jumping up, we've seen a higher percentage of contracts falling through. Now, the good news about this is that for a lot of the contracts that fall through, eventually they go through. But we're seeing a, a kind of a shift kind of going on. And so uh, now for the folks, for some folks, um, one of the big things is that the interest rates are really causing their financing to really kind of get questioned and, and their loan amounts to where they're having to come back and go with a load or loan amount kind of thing. Well, what it is, is that, you know, lender look at debt to income ratio. And so it doesn't matter if the interest, if a purchase price at 300 or 400,000, if the interest rate rises, it does take a chunk of the affordability on monthly payment. And that's the key. They still have to meet that debt to income ratio where they can't exceed X amount payment per month. So when the interest rate rises, it increases their monthly mortgages. Well, and, and that's the other side of things is that we, we have, we've had uh, clients that, that went out and got their, their pre-approvals and, and they talked to their lenders at four, five, and five and a half percent. And now we're, we're running a 6.7. 6 yeah, yeah, this I mean, is my one of the highest. And, and so, you know, it's one of those where, it's not that that they can't necessarily qualify. It's that they go in and they and they get sticker shock about what that payment's really going to do. Because folks, right. look, our buyers are buying on payment; they're not buying on price, and so they're having to go back and look at that. So making sure that they that they've that our clients have had a a very close or a very recent chat with the lender about what you know what what is that what is this current interest rate and what does that payment look like. Uh, we're not having as many appraisal issues, but we still are having some. I mean, well, there'll always be some kind of appraisal issues out there, but but we are having some. But you know, the, probably the last big one that, that we have is just our buyers' kind of uneasiness with the market, and so we see some folks that have some buyers' remorse. Absolutely, but, but a lot of that happens just because they don't feel confident about what's going on, and and really that's up to us to kind of explain, you know, during, you know during the, the the inspection periods, do it during due diligence about, you know, like 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 we're and, and we'll talk about this more today. We're not seeing a, a decline in property values. We're just seeing where the rate of appreciation isn't as high as it was. It's as, not as it has a double been. digit and, anymore, and, and that's happy. I mean, well, I'm not happy. We're happy for it. We're, we're, like like double digit price appreciation is not sustainable long term. That's correct. Um, so no one earns twenty percent more this year than they did last year than the year before and the year before. So that's just really not uh, a realistic um, thing and, that we have and going just on. So you know that during pandemic, a lot of people really saved. The reason they saved because they can't <laughs> or go out and put entertainment. Yep. So you know for the last for the last six months, buyers are out and doing more purchase and just be careful that you're not overspending what you're able to and that's going to create another debt to income ratio okay now i was kind of uh, you know I'm, I'm always looking for for good content for us to kind of discuss with, with right. everybody and so i kind of came across this one and it struck me as so uh relative to things i see happening in the it, here in in our industry right now and that is like, like we have to be in love with our phones, uh, you know, um, and, and so, you know, this is, this, I just wanted to kind of share this with you that, that you know, uh, a hiker got lost on a mountain in Colorado and ignored the calls from the rescuers because it wasn't a number that he didn't know, right? So, yeah. I, I, like, like, it was a couple of weeks ago, I'm in the office and and one of our agents is kind of going, man, no one answers their phone. I've called this agent. I've called this agent. I've called these people. No one's answered the phone. No one's answering their phone. Meanwhile, her phone rings. She looks over, looks at it, sees it's a number she doesn't know, puts it on bypass and continues to complain to me. 
so like 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 we have to look at, at like like uh, so much of our business comes from our phone it's so vital that that we'd be wise about like like if you don't know that number good that's a really good thing right because we want people to be calling us and now i don't know anyone that likes spam none of us like spam and and yes uh, i i may have said some inappropriate things to people in the past <laughs> but that being said it, it like like it's 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 the cost of doing business right it we is. gotta be ready for that it is so and so when you don't answer your phone you don't know what the opportunity yep. may or may not be and you know it doesn't take about a two second to answer to a spam after that you can block them yeah. so they won't call you again yeah. or your phone will tell you it's a spammer all right so um just this past week uh fmls has announced that they are partnering with uh, Chattanooga, Chattanooga Realtors. Uh, the Chattanooga Realtors. And so right now, FMLS also has Alabama, and now we have parts of Florida that are all being included. And and, and like it, it sounds really cool. And and I'm I guess sharing information. I'm always very pro with, mm -hmm. but we also have to understand that that for those of us that are not licensed in Tennessee, guess what? You can't go sell real estate in Tennessee, you right? You can look at the data. I mean, you want, yeah, you can look, but and you can't. You can sell poke around. Those... And so, you know, like, like if you want, if you want to go sell a house in Chattanooga or Alabama or any of these other places where you can now have the access to go look, like, like you have to go get your license in that corresponding state. So get a written. You know, most mm -hmm. of them. You know, most of the states that touch Georgia will will do reciprocity like reciprocity agreements there. Uh, and and then you have to go get affiliated with a broker there. You have to sign up for uh, most of the time in most states, you have to sign up for a local board in order to be access to, to the MLS there. And, and so you're going to have all those same costs associated. Uh, and, and, and so when you try and sell outside of state, like, like your license is only good here in Georgia. Well, the problem with selling outside of state is that you don't understand that local market. You know, what may true maybe hold true here in Atlanta may not hold true for Chattanooga. So it is hard to give your client a good advice on the marketing and also what's going on in that area if you're not around there or have mm -hmm. consulted with someone that knows the area. I mean, we had, we've had clients ask us, hey, can you help me out in Savannah? No, I, I don't. I don't know Savannah. We we don't you know like, like we don't want to misrepresent ourselves, and 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 we're not we're not an expert of the Savannah market. So that that wouldn't be good for me to go and say, oh, I can write it up. I mean, legally, we could write, up, write, up, write, write it up anywhere in the state of Georgia. But like like just understand that even though we have the access to these tools, and I, and I do like the access. I'm I'm a big fan of that. That being said, I, I got I've gotten multiple calls over the last month or so saying. Hey, how do I, how, you know, what can I do about getting property in, in Tennessee or in Alabama and all this other kind of stuff uh, and representing clients there? And the bottom line is you got to go be a realtor in that state as well. And then you'll be in, then you'll need to be responsible for answering to either the Alabama Association, I mean, or, you know, their, their version of GREC or Tennessee's version of GREC or Florida's, you know, right. they're all called something. Yeah, different. the data are awesome. Yeah. Seriously, it is awesome for knowledge base. But once again, if you don't know the area and what the market's doing, if you know don't have a specific yeah. needs that yeah. you may not be able to obtain, then that's an issue. Yeah. Now, NAR uh, shared some information. Well, well, they shared the realtors' um, uh, safety results. So they polled realtors kind of thing, uh, you know, talking about their safety and the different situations out there. Uh, and so, like, and, and, and when it comes to safety, first of all, if your spidey sense is tingling, if you feel something's right, listen to yourself. Okay, that, that's probably one of the best pieces of advice. Like, like if something smells like a duck and walks like a duck and sounds like, like a duck. I mean, if, if you feel <laughs> creepy duck. about any situation, you know, get a partner, get your broker, get some help, you know, that kind of stuff. But but you shouldn't ever feel um scared or unsafe in any situation that being said uh you know in the past year 23 percent of realtors experienced a situation that made them fear that made them feel fearful and so that worries me that uneasy uneasy fearful that kind of stuff or just worried about their personal safety and and, and you know um that, that's one of those things that's where we, we have to be very very Almost conscious of you know one, one out of four Realtors has had a scary situation this past year, and that that's concerning for me. We know that you know 
I mean, I'm, I'm one of these who wants to believe the best in people, but I'm also a realist and not everybody's good kind of thing. So I know that's kind of a negative thing. Um, no, but, you know, just listen to your gut instinct. If your instincts tell you something, then listen to it. Yeah. Don't let that monetary dollar persuade you doing something that you know is not good for you. Well, and and so like like of those quarter who felt uneasy, you know, a third of it happened through inappropriate email, text messages, phone calls, voicemails. So if you get the creepy guy that calls like, hey, mm -hmm. what you doing? You're kind of pretty kind of thing. Like like you need to cut that mess off real fast, right? Or um, they start hitting on you, a client yeah. start hitting on you. And obviously they probably social stalk you before they select you. And we actually had an agent that put her license in an active because this one client was making inappropriate um gestures yeah. and, and comments and but so we want we want to help help you avoid that as much as possible you know 27 percent felt uncomfortable during a showing 26 mm -hmm. percent when when they were showing a, a a client the you know meeting a client in a secluded property for the yeah. first time please please have somebody well, have a buddy system yeah. i don't care if you bring your son and leave it in your car or what have you um uh, you know have a system spouses sort. friends co-workers like, like like we gotta look out for each other so if you need me call me call ming that kind of stuff like like it's a big deal if you don't feel safe and we want you to Absolutely. feel safe um you know uh overall you know um what real you know what's like the biggest crime that's actually happening to us what's interesting here is it's actually vi i mean um not violent crime but identity theft is mm -hmm. one of our biggest deals out there so protecting ourselves online you know not answering those scammy uh, emails I, I promise there's not a nigerian prince out there that's offering you millions of dollars so we got to be smart about about our identity theft on there uh now also in the past 12 months uh, you know, 34% of realtors met a new or prospective client alone at a secluded property. Yeah, that's an alarming, alarming amount of agents that are not yeah. looking at their safety as a precautionary. Have them meet you at the office first. Get a pre-approval letter. Have some interaction. And if you have to go, go with someone, you know, bring your, your spouse or, or a coworker, someone along with you. Uh, you know, when you do walk into that house, never go through the door first. Mm -mm. Seriously, you open the door, step back, because the last thing you want is your back, you know, like exposed to them as you walk through or never go into the basement first, things like that. Just just be very, very smart. At the same time, these are, you know, about 18 percent of realtors felt unsafe while hosting an open house alone y'all need to have buddy systems i mean you well, know there's no way you can do it all especially well, and check you, out the open house i mean check out the property beforehand how, yeah. you know, how much visibility is it? Is it you know like like you know oh it's it's five miles down a dirt road you know right. located back here behind the, the wall of chainsaws kind of thing i mean let, let's just be smart about things like this and so if you if you do feel unsafe fix that like like we're all independent contractors you are your own small business person and so your safety is is paramount but i won't know if you don't tell us so we're, we're here to kind of help right. with that uh for those who are using self-defense weapons the number one thing is pepper spray after that we have a lot of agents that that, oh, that, that, carry. that carry and so we we do have some some concealed carry classes and think not that concealed carry is necessary in georgia but we still have to be very wise about that you know, eight percent pocket knives, high power flashlights. I'm really surprised what, what how low the tasers are because you know now my wife she carries a taser. Is right. it charged? No, not <laughs> normally, right? Most of the time, I'm the one has to charge it for so that kind of thing. So just but but you know we have to be conscious of our safety. It's so so important right there. Um, moving back into uh, more nice. traditional real estate. Sorry, I didn't mean to bust you out there. So yeah, yeah. The main yeah, the big do, do always did. It. So <laughs> I have one that actually charged in the car. So before showing that I'm going to this place that uh, I'm a very uncomfortable or slightly have any reflection of uh, safety issues, I make sure those bad boys are charged. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right. So interest rates right now, interest rates jumped up again last week. And so what we're seeing is interest rates are a direct reflection of what's happening with inflation. You know, inflation did, is what's we driving predict, We did predict that it's going to be up 6%, but we didn't predict to be at the highest today. Yep. So, well, but, you know, I really see it leveling off here. Um, but, you know, it, it's all the volatility and the uncertainty in the financial markets that's really causing this mm-hmm. right now. So, um, you know, th- that's driving it down. Now, one thing that, that did come out this past week from FHA, which I, which is really good, is FHA went to all the lenders and said, hey, we want you to include, to be able to include rental payments for your first time buyers. Because, you know, traditionally, uh, a lot of lenders and, and even- Do not take history. No, don't, your... don't, look, don't look at your rental payment. And so it's like, well, I've been paying $1,500 a month, or I've been paying $2,000 a month. So paying a $1,600 a month mortgage is not going to be any problem. I've always paid my rent on time. All right. But that wasn't able to be used. And so this past week, Experian, one of the big three credit unions, they started putting Deploying. that in there. And uh, now now lenders for FHA can now start considering that as a basis for approving clients. So we find that to be a really positive move in the right direction there. And, you know, this is in line with demand of the market because a lot of your first time home buyers do have the history of a good payment. And but unfortunately, because there's no other credit line. Um, a lot of them don't understand that they need multiple credit mm-hmm. lines. Um, and so therefore, you know, it's hard to get them a loan based on that. Now, if you saw the headlines, you know, this week, you'll see where it says uh, the S&P CoreLogic Case Shiller Index continued its deceleration. And that sounds really, really intimidating. It sounds like, 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 well, I mean, <laughs> deceleration, like, like that's a bad word. Yes. So like, like, like the real estate market must be doing really, really poorly kind of thing. And so overall, you know, they went through it and, and they pulled up and they said, you know what? It's down about two point something percent uh, from the previous month. And so, you know, overall, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's up significantly. Okay. And so we're still in double digit price growth but we're not as high of double digit price growth. And so they want to make, they want to scare the daylights out of you. So instead of having 18% property value appreciation, we had 15% property value appreciation. Oh my goodness. The real estate market is crashing into, I mean, it's just on fire right now because we're only keeping double digit price growth right now. Honestly, you guys, um, I see a, a decline in the growth but I don't see a decline in the valuation of the property. Right. So like, like if you look at this is this is actually the graph that corresponds to that. And so can you see where the growth number is starting to taper down? Like if you look all the way in the far left, that's where it was a year previous. Right. So no, we're still here. Well, I mean, well, yeah, right. Right. That, that, that's the beginning of this year to now. So has it tapered down from from where it was last month and the month before? Absolutely. Yes. Is it still significantly higher? It's still on just on since January, it's up 10.8%. So yeah, it's not high as high as it was, but just since January, property values have increased 10%. Correct. We want to see this much closer to that three, four, five percent property value increase, because that's historically, I mean, if you put, you know, if you laid out property values for the last 50 years, it's 4.4% annual growth. And so seeing us still in double digit, don't think that this is a, that the housing market is terrible because for most of our consumers, especially for our sellers, mm-hmm. they're going to say, how good is the housing market based on how much my home is worth? Is my home worth as much or more than it was last week, last year, two years ago? The answer is yes, yes, yes. Okay. So we're still running double digit price growth. We need to start seeing some single digit price growth for this really to be healthy. So don't get freaked out by, by what things. you hear online. Yeah. So understand your source and what they what their bases are. Yeah. And that's important. But let's look at the rest of the numbers here. So, you know, this this right here is our median days on market. So you, you'll notice that it, it is all the way up to 16 days. That's up from 14 days. So Yep, we are seeing an increase on days on market. Uh-huh. If you Those look at days. if you look at historically where we're sitting at, we're sitting in really good shape. And usually it takes about 
inventory being six months in order to be what we call a flat market. Yeah, we're at okay? two right now. We're at two months right now. So now this is the number of offers received on the most recent sale. Now at the peak, we we're at five and a half offers per property. Now we're at <laughs> yeah. two and a half, which is guess what? Normal. Yeah. Okay. That's that like like we're into the range of normality now. It hasn't been normal for the last couple of years. And now we're moving back into the range of normal. Uh, buyers that are waiving contingencies, that is down huge. And thank goodness and it thank is. thank you. Right. We're, we're, we're so glad that this is down. We don't want our buyers to be waiving financing or appraisal contingencies or, or, I mean, or inspections. Issues. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, like yeah. that's yeah. good. We don't want you know, that it, to be it, going it on. It is an investment for the buyers. So yep. therefore, they want to make sure whatever they spend is a good money uh after a good product yeah so there's nothing worse moving a house and then you got all these repair on top of it when you're when your budget's already stretched so all cash buyers is actually down which we're glad to see that as well you know all the market volatility is causing a lot of our investors to kind of put that on pause so that's a real good sign how about foreclosures uh foreclosure is lowest level ever and some folks are like, well, what's happening with foreclosures? Is the foreclosure market coming back? Are we hitting in 2008? No, because I don't know anybody who's upside down in their home right now. Like, like even if you bought recently, you can see that properties are still growing. In a, in pre, thank you. Exactly. But not, at, but not as aggressive yeah. as the last, you know, probably a year ago, but it's still appreciating. Now, here's one area that where we have seen a significant drop off, and that is non-primary residence buyers, meaning second, second home, homes, vacation second, homes. Yeah, second home, vacation homes. So we are seeing places like inventory increasing on some of our lake properties, mountain properties, things like that, because that that's always been a heavy second market or second home market. Mm -hmm. And now that second home market has really kind of tapered well, off significantly. And the reason why they, they were so popular during pandemic is because the interest rate was so cheap. Yep. And so therefore it makes sense to have a second home when you can't spend your money elsewhere in entertainment. Yep. Now our first time buyer share, it continues to be at some of its lowest levels. Mm -hmm. And this is, is indicative of one thing where we see so much pent up demand right now. You can see that in, you know, historically we should be running closer to 40% first time buyers especially over the next four years. The next four years, the largest population group we have is between 28 and 32, and there, and there are millennial buyers. And that's a very significant time because the first time home buyer age is 33. So we have the largest population group in the United States reaching first time buyer age over the next four years. And however, our first time buyer percentage is at some of its lowest ever. There's a ton of demand. And once we see interest rates really start tapering off, I think we're going to see this really start to explode here. Absolutely. So um, new home sales jumped unexpectedly. And Which this is, is good. good and bad, okay? Because here's the deal is that um, basically um, the builders went in and saw that, that things were slowing down. And so the builders went out and they cut prices. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of the builders dropped prices, dropped prices, dropped prices, moved the inventory, which jumped it up significantly kind of thing, almost 19% jump. And then they stopped pulling permits. So like, like, like long-term, this is not a good thing. Short-term, I'm, I'm glad to see more, more new construction rolling, that kind of stuff. However, you know, the fact this that is they're going to put a halt and this, it's going to have its uh, recourses, just like when pandemic hit with shipping supplies, uh, where it was docked and kept, you know, well, in the dock. So this is going to have some impact down the road. Well, what we see is this is going to have an impact on our, on our spring buying season is mm -hmm. what's really going to happen. Because right now, most of our builders are running about a six month time frame. As far as going from permit to close is somewhere, you know, with all the delays and all this other kind of stuff, some of them are running six months. And if you put a six months from now, where's that? Well, word? that's assuming too that yeah. the supply chain. But, 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 but even if we go four to six months, that's putting us into the spring buying season. And so if they're not pulling enough permits now, now. then that spring buying season is going to be really, really challenging for new construction. So we continue to see, yes, a number of our uh, we, we have less buyers on here that are, that are able to qualify. The more the interest rates are holding them down, but we also have a lot less supply as well, which is what's going on.
Now, one good, you know, like a bright spot of construction is the cost of lumber has now reached pre-pandemic levels. So you can kind of see on here where, you know, like like lumber is back to where it was like it should. five years ago right now. Uh, and so we're really, really pleased to see that lumber levels or lumber values are coming back down. That's one of those things that will help the values or the prices on new construction to kind of soften up that kind of thing. Absolutely. Um, what are the states with the biggest homes? Well, this is a really cool thing for us here in Georgia because Georgia has the six, it is the sixth six largest. Oh, well, it's where, where the, the six ranking. The, yeah, yeah. We rank number six <laughs> as the homes with, as the largest. states with the largest homes. So our median square foot home is 2,262 square feet and 180 bucks a foot kind of thing. Now, one other thing that you'll find really interesting in there is, is we also have some of the lowest price per square foot um, out there which is why we have a positive inflow of people moving into Georgia. Like this is one of those things because like, like when you look at your at, at like square foot, you know, value per square foot, we, we rank really good. Yeah. That was easy for me to say, <laughs> be funny right now. Uh, but you know, like, like, like that's a, like, like right now, um, New York city or New York is the number one destination for Georgia. Uh, more people come to Georgia from New York, New York than any other state. And if you look at what property values are and what, you know, what will $400,000, $500,000 get you in New York and what will four or $500,000 get you in Georgia, we come out like winners, we smell huge like winners. Roses. So we're actually second in ranking as far as price per square foot of all top 10 yep. as far as the biggest home um, sizes. Now, we're getting bigger too because this is one of the cities with the biggest increases in in new home sizes guess what atlanta's number five our new construction has has been up 44 percent as far as overall square footage of where we're going so uh like like we're big and we're getting bigger right and so uh that sounds weird when you put it that way <laughs> uh, but well, anyway, for a lot of our buyers, it's a very I, positive thing. Is, we like actually, we like bigger houses. You know, I see employer now doing a lot of um, commute or hybrid, where they only yeah. come to the office two or three days, if that. Uh, so having the square footage in the house to work out of is important. Yeah. Now, uh, JA Junior Achievement and Fannie Mae did a, did a survey, and they can't. They found that eighty eight percent of teens want to own a home someday. 40 only however only about less 45. than half 45 percent could actually identify what a mortgage is and almost 100 percent, 97 percent of teens thought it would be helpful if they learned about this in school now I'm, a real, I'm, 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 I'm 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 realistic about like will the schools do this on their own i don't think they will no. but can we reach out to the schools to Absolutely. reach out to younger homeowners these kind of things this, i mean teens want to know folks want to understand this is also indicative of me of like, 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 like it's been this way. Yeah. Th they surveyed these teens now, but what about those folks that graduated five years ago? They have the same concerns. We have so many of our first time buyers, you know, like, like, like that number almost matches all, a lot of our first time buyers in that they're, they're like, I don't know what a mortgage is. Well, I, I, I don't I'll know what, you, you know. what shocks me is that one time I'll try to do a, a buyer consultation and the buyer's like, after about 20 minutes into it, they're like, stop right there i'm like what she's they're like we have no idea what you're saying we just want to buy a house yeah so, <laughs> okay but, but we have to explain this to folks so like 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 understanding that that like uh it's not the school's job to teach folks about and, mortgages and, and up, the home buying I don't process think and my that parents kind of thing. ever told me about mortgage uh we just assumed everything was provided so therefore i think you know with the information technology with all the millennials and Gen Z and the one behind them, educate, they, educate, they, educate. they get so much information overload. And yep. so therefore, this is a force, a area that they may be lacking of education. So, you know, agents, I will suggest you partner up with the school yep. and start doing education. Granted, we, you will never see the return immediately but they hopefully they will be in your pipeline well, down the road. And, and be ready to educate not the ones who are teens, like 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 those millennials right now okay. need Gen Z. They yeah. need this education. Consultations. Yeah. So um, so Meta um came out. Okay, Met Facebook, Facebook. Which you see is here, right? 
So guess what's happening on January, the end of January this of, of this year coming up? Uh, you will not be able to advertise real estate on your Facebook business pages. Now, the reason this is a really big deal is because like, like one thing that, that we teach is that you need to have a Facebook business page as well as a personal mm -hmm. page and they have to work together you know we know that that our personal pages are there for engagement and relationships and that kind of stuff and you're still going to be able to advertise properties on your personal page however greg says that if we advertise a property the broker's contact mm -hmm. information must be available Correct. most of the time within one click away and so on our business pages you know, we teach and we instruct agents, look, make sure that your brokerage contact information, your logo, those kind of things are all on your Facebook business page. So if someone were to go there and see property listed, they, that your broker is available, that protects you with Greg and, and, and we're, and, and we're, we're, we're teaching or we're, we're keeping consumer protections important Absolutely. as part of the real estate process. With this change with Meta, let, let's face it, that they're they're kind of moving this to where they want the only way this can be done is if you pay them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's really what this is coming down to. And so, you know, uh, uh, you know, they want you to kind of build real estate with, you know, with, you know, with Facebook, that kind of thing. And so they're trying to monetize what they're doing. But for us, we have to look at like, what's the legality of this also, because we can't I can't go list a property on my personal page that doesn't have the broker's contact information on it. So are you gonna put your broker's contact information on your personal page now? You might uh, want I mean, to consider as a it, background it, You have to really consider okay. about what you're gonna be doing as this goes ahead. So if you share a lot of listings on your out of your business Perfect. page right now, right. Like, like that won't be able to happen come February 1. Correct. And so you gotta start thinking about how am I gonna either position my business? How am I gonna shift things over? What will I do with that? If you share a lot of types of listings like that, uh, and then what, you know, where are these listings coming from? And so like, if you're sharing listings that has your broker's contact information on there, well, then that's okay for you to be sharing because you, your broker's contact information is there and available, but you have to be advertising under the name of your broker, brokerage. So just make sure that you're being really smart about that. Because I can tell you right now, there's kind of going to be a lot of fine coming around if you don't keep in compliance. And then uh, just kind of wrap it up on the quirky Not and from fun me, things. From a lot of, from Greg. So the Stranger Things home. So the Stranger Things home was over in Fayetteville kind of thing. And it went under contract, you know, after about twice for the listing price for after <laughs> uh, yeah and, and so like like if, like if you're Crazy. a fan of the show uh, they are going to be turning into an airbnb. airbnb so i just i don't know why like like my daughter and i we we, we watch the show we love the show and that kind of stuff so i just thought it was really kind of funny um in all of our partners offices now all the tom ferry success summit replays are available so come in schedule those uh or not schedule just come in and view any of the ones that right. you need and let me tell you, this yeah. year was probably the best year at Tom Ferry Summit. Um, it's got a lot of content. So if you are looking at to be in a note, yeah, please do come in and enjoy the, the replay. Now, tomorrow, my lovely bride here is going to be teaching license law for agents and brokers. That's going to be in our Conyers office. And that is required for every four-year renewal. Yeah, you have to have 36 of CE, three of which has to be license law, and this meets the license law requirement. Correct. On Wednesday, we have Matrix working with clients in one home. One home is Matrix's new tool that they're rolling out kind of thing. And so that's going to be here in our McDonough office. And then on Thursday, there's the game of credit. Teresa McIntosh is teaching that. That one's going to be uh, virtual. So we encourage you to, to really kind of jump in uh, and, and get your education on. So if, uh, if uh, we hope that you guys have a great week. Uh, if you, we can be of any kind of service, please call, text, smoke signals. We answer it all. Y'all have a great one. Love Thank ya. you. Have a great Monday. Bye-bye. Take care.